saying, well, I don't like your ideas, that's wrong, I'll censor it. You know, the people must not hear your horrible ideas because they're too, too much like children who will be misled by it. You say, even though I think what you're saying is wrong, you know, you have the right to express that in, in, the, in the most articulate, coherent way that you could possibly express those kinds of arguments. What tolerance really means, you know, by having this active orientation towards ideas, what it really means is that it's a, you uphold the freedom of conscience, you recognize that people's conscience is something that is a protected area that you do not intrude upon, you don't simply allow people to violate their, 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 their kind of conscience, their kind of basic inner thoughts, and you also uphold the idea of individual autonomy. I know individual autonomy is, is, is seen as a is a bad term these days, but actually individual autonomy, the, which basically means the capacity, recognizing that people have the capacity to act independently, independently with a degree of moral independence, and that people should be encouraged to act autonomously so long as they're prepared to live with the consequences of their action, so long as they're prepared to take responsibility for what they have done, is, a, is an important element in the search for the truth in terms of clarifying and struggling for ideas that will potentially take society forward. And it seems to me that what Cameron has done is accepted this new development whereby tolerance has been almost surreptitiously redefined as a kind of pleasant form of a very courteous form of non-judgmentalism. So tolerance means, and you see this all the time, I, I know for example when my son was seven he came home from school with all these UNESCO handouts, and you see a little black child, a little white child, a, 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 somebody from Asia, a Chinese person, and they're all holding each other, cuddling like this, and, and he got the impression this is what tolerance means, just being ever so nice to each other, ever so pleasant to each other, which, which is fine, I think it's good when children, you know, sort of solidarize with each other, but it's got nothing to do with tolerance. It's not a, a polite, ge polite gesture, in the way that it's kind of presented. It seems to me it's something to do with a commitment to judge, and that, 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 that is really ultimately the key dimension of it. Now, one of the problems, as I see it, with non-judgmentalism as a virtue that has emerged, is not that we want to go around and judge people all the time. And I know, and you know, that sometimes when people judge, make judgments, they're making judgments on the basis of their prejudices, they're making judgments on the basis of not really having thought very much about what they really are doing. One of the things that has occurred, in, in, particularly in the Anglo-American context, is as, as non-judgmentalism has been seen as, as, as really the most important value, and in fact there's been a study carried out by, Ameri by uh, an American sociologist called Alan Wolf, where he went around, he asked around, you know, a huge study about 42,000 people, he tried to find out what is the number one value that Americans signed up to, and, and the number one value that all Americans said they believed, defined them as American was being non-judgmental. <coughs> they, you know, they, they weren't judging each other. And, and for them that was seen as a virtue rather than a problem that essentially they weren't very debating, arguing, uh, and, and, and genuinely communicating with each other. One of the problems I see, and I'd love to have your views on this, uh, uh, is this. If you have a non-judgmental culture, and we're not, we don't think that it's important for us to question each other and to criticize. And we don't think it's important for people's uh, horrible ideals to be aired, because somehow we think that free speech needs to be limited. You know, we spend more energy trying to find limits to free speech than trying to expand it. One of the consequences of that is our language changes. And as somebody who's not English, I become very, and, and therefore I'm a bit of a, take a bit of a distance from the English language, I really noticed that since I've lived in England and, and been traveling around America and Canada, the way we speak, the words we use, has become increasingly influenced by this ever, ever kind of fuzzy, incoherent, non-judgmental mediums of communication. And you get that at university. The universities are always the, the places where linguistic innovations and where intellectual innovations and cultural innovations really acquire their, their, their kind of strength in the first instance. And again, 
you know, when you're looking at websites, when, you, when you're looking at documents that you get as an academic in universities, it's, it's really very, very interesting that, that most of the, that we, that we now have developed in the universities and elsewhere, an entire vocabulary of euphemisms. <coughs> euphemisms that are expressly developed in order to be unclear. Right? In order to spare the individual of the burden of having to express themselves with any degree of clarity. I mean, take, one, take one word, that's my, as a Hungarian, every time I hear the word, I feel like, you know, sort of crawling back into bed. Something happens, and, you know, something goes awry, and before we know it, somebody says, that's inappropriate behavior. You know, that is really inappropriate. And what's inappropriate? We don't say it's bad, malevolent, evil, criminal. <coughs> and we don't kind of give it a real moral content. Inappropriate, well, you know, it's inappropriate. It's, it's kind of ill-defined. It doesn't really mean very much. And the very fact that we're using words like inappropriate as a, as a way of expressing our, our, our criticism, you know, as a way of expressing the fact that we don't like what, what's being done, instead of being blunt and clear as to what it is that we don't like, very much represents a cultural statement about the person who's communicating that. Or take another word, it's very fashionable in London universities. You don't like something, you, know, you, you don't like the way I, I dress or I, the way I talk, I swear. Frank's behavior is really problematic. Have you ever heard that? <laughs> problematic. They're very cute, you know. The first time I encountered problematic was when I read Louis Althusser's Reading Capital, you know, and he's as problematic, you know, sort of in a, in a slightly more rigorous kind of a way. But poor old Louis, you know, sort of must be turning in his grave when you think, you know, how problematic has become this kind of concept that, you know, has its, the only virtue that problematic has is you got no idea what the problem is. You know, you, you got no idea what is being, uh, you know, uh, you know what, what is that issue. And I can give you loads of loads. The other thing, when I'm in the United States, and I kind of, you know, I had this experience myself. I, I use an old, you know, uh, sort of Socratic method of teaching. So when people come to my seminars, you know, I don't just say, well, you know, what do you think of this? And they answer me. I carry on, and, and, and why is that? And why is this? You know, sort of, and what, and I'm just kind of pressurizing people, <laughs> try to stretch them intellectually as much as possible so that they come to their own conclusion, come to their own answer in, in, their, in their struggle for the truth. And I remember this guy, you know, sort of kind of looks at me and, uh, and, and says to me afterwards, I think your teaching style, sir, makes me feel a little bit uncomfortable. <laughs> and I love the idea of, of you know, I'm, I'm, I'm uncomfortable with this. You know, you know, I mean, what is that? You know, I'm uncomfortable with this. You know, what are you actually getting at? What you're really saying is get the fuck out of here. I really don't like you. You know, you're a horrible person. But instead of actually being blunt and clear, and saying what you want to say, you say, oh, I'm, I'm really uncomfortable, sir. You know, and, and, I, and I could give you a lot, lot more of these examples of the way that our language has changed in line with our non-judgmentalism, in, in line with our, with our commitment not to debate, not to argue, not to be clear in terms of our, our concerns and, and the direction of our travel. And of course, uh, this kind of trend of non-judgmentalism is particularly visible in schools. I mean, I've noticed this when my son is, is not finished university, so it was seven or eight years ago. You know, when my son's teachers would use a language that at first I thought was a mistake. I thought they really were, you know, they didn't really mean what they were saying, but they were using, you know, instead of talking about children in, in a way that was understandable to an average normal human being, you know, basically they would talk about children as having special needs. Well, I've never met anybody who hasn't got special, special needs. I've got special needs. We all have special needs. So, but apparently, it, it now means something very, very different. We have children who are hard to reach. You know, where I come from, they talk about poor kids, you know, impoverished children who come from families. They haven't got a, a pot to piss in. What we call them, these are hard to reach kind of children because, you know, that avoids, you know, actually telling reality or talking about reality in, in the way it is. We talk about children as gifted and talented, and usually gifted children are the very opposite, which is why we call them gifted, because what we're trying to say is that, all right, so they're not Einsteins, but nevertheless, they must have some kind of gift for them. And there's a, there's a veritable you know, 
vocabulary, a dictionary of these kinds of words that are very much uh, sort of there to avoid uh, sort of talking about these kinds of things. Now Hannah Arendt characterized the reluctance to judge as an expression of a disinclination towards public association and writes of the blind obstinacy that becomes manifest in the lack of imagination and the failure of, to judge. And as you know from Hannah Arendt, what she's really saying is that to judge is not an optional extra, it's a public duty. That it is your public duty as a citizen to make judgments and to kind of engage in relations of judgment with other kind of people. And drawing on Kant's critique of judgment, Hannah Arendt wrote of an enlarged way of thinking, which is judgment knows how to transcend its own individual limitations. Now, conventionally, judgment is seen as being very narrow. Only prejudiced people judge. But actually, what Hannah Arendt is arguing is the very opposite. What she's really arguing is that it's in the course of making judgments about the, uh, <coughs> about the words and the statements that we encounter with our, with our fellow citizens in the, of make, in the course of making judgments that our horizons actually expand. So rather than narrowing our horizons, it kind of expands our horizons. And basically, the way she puts it, and this is what she says, is that judging plays a central role in disclosing to individuals the nature of their public world. Judging is one, if not, if not the most important activity, in which this sharing of the world with others come to pass. <coughs> so, What's really important about judgment is that it's not just that simply you're dismissing somebody else's argument. What, it, what she really is getting at, and I think this is the, the wonderful insight that she provides with us, is that it's in, a, it's in the very act of judging the statement of another citizen that the potential for agreement also comes about. That's the irony. There's an interesting dialectic there. It's in the very act of judging a statement of arguing and debating, that you don't simply just disagree, but actually struggle towards realizing the potential that we have as people with common responsibilities towards the world in actually coming